Timothy chapter 1. I want to say thanks to those of you who have been so sympathetic. Uh, uh, all these little jokes that you guys are cracking. But uh, yeah, I, I passed a kidney stone yesterday, and uh, what an experience that is. Uh, not a lot of fun, but uh, anyway, we're here, and uh, the pain meds are really, really helpful. I've got to tell you that. My topic this morning is labor of love, and of course, the uh, text passage that has been dealt with for the weekend is here in Second Timothy. Let's read it very quickly, and then we will uh, go ahead and move on. Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. Now drop down to verse 12. For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am ashamed, for I know whom I have believed. Father, we do thank you for your grace, your goodness, your love. We thank you, Father, for, uh, of course, the life that you give freely because of your kindness, because of your mercy. And Lord, we just pray now as, that as we continue to examine the, uh, the spirit that uh, operates, that ought to operate in each of our lives, uh, may we now concentrate on that issue of love and uh, how it is, it truly is the mark of uh, spiritual maturity. We pray that our time together would be edifying, encouraging, and may all things, as always, redound to the glory of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, in whose name we pray. Amen. Amen. We're going to look this morning at the issue of the labor of love. Now, although the Apostle Paul here isn't uh, using the expression labor of love, obviously there's an issue here regarding love. And as Paul already is exhorting Timothy to press on in the work of the ministry, he, of course, lays out that triad, that abiding trinity, if you will. Now, in verse 7, he talks about power, love, and a sound mind. And what we're going to do for this morning is look at that issue of love. We're especially going to look at the labor of love. But I want you to notice when we go down to verse 12, when Paul here says, For the which cause I also suffer these things, nevertheless I am not ashamed. Just keep that in mind because we're going to go in a few minutes to Romans chapter 5. He says right after... He says, I am not ashamed. He says, for I know whom I have believed. Interesting. In light of the context and the potential sufferings and the afflictions, certainly in verse 8, he says, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me as prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of the gospel. And so as Paul is relating to Timothy that there is a cost to the work of the ministry. There will be afflictions. There will be hardship. What we learn here is that the one thing that sustained the Apostle Paul in light of the afflictions is not so much a thing as it is the person of our Lord Jesus Christ. And when Paul in verse 12 talks about, I'm not ashamed, the reason for it is, I know whom I have believed. There is something about the Lord Jesus Christ. There is this fuller, deeper knowledge concerning the Lord Jesus Christ that actually sustained the Apostle Paul in light of the ministry, in light of the afflictions. Now, go, go to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. Uh, the title is Labor of Love. And, um, you know, the world uses that expression, labor of love. I mean, you know, if you want to operate an animal rescue, if you want to walk 100 miles for cancer, if you want to be a volunteer at a nursing home, the world uses that expression. It's a labor of love. Well, what makes the world's definition of love or labor of love different than the Bible? definition of labor of love. Obviously, there has to be a difference. And, and in fact, there is a difference. When the world uses the expression labor of love, sure, certainly there are kind, benevolent acts that uh, people can engage in. Hey, I am not against rescuing animals. I'm not against volunteering at a nursing home. I'm not against trying to eradicate diseases and afflictions and infirmities. But uh, when the world talks about 
the labor of love. It is quite different than when the Bible talks about it. And I hope we can appreciate the distinction. When the Bible talks about labor of love, it's a type of labor. It's the quality of labor that results from the highest of spiritual virtue. It's the type of labor that is the product of the highest level of spiritual maturity. Now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, here's where we find the expression. Verse 3, remembering without ceasing your work of faith and, here we go, labor of love. So, what makes the Bible's labor of love different than the world's labor of love? Go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and and we certainly can recognize that the type of labor that we are called upon to engage in is an important labor, without doubt. But it's a labor that is actually produced. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, it's a labor that results from a high level of love a godly level of love, a spirit-led labor of love, which is different. Um, Somebody just mentioned, you know, um, Prince. Evidently, he would donate hundreds of thousands of dollars for charitable causes. Now, of course, the reason he is donating hundreds of thousands of dollars for charitable causes is because he's trying to buy his ticket before Jehovah, Jehovah's Witness, okay? Um, Well, why is his labor of, quote, love a little different? Here in 1 Corinthians chapter 13, notice there in verse 3, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor. Is feeding the poor a good thing? Is it an act of benevolence? Is it a kind act? Yes, But notice what Paul says, and though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, and though I give my body to be burned and have not what? Charity. It profiteth me nothing. Wait a minute. If you gave all of your financial resources to feed the poor, isn't that in and of itself an act of charity? Paul here says it's possible to give all of your worldly possessions to the poor, but if it's not done in charity, there's no profit. So obviously there has to be a difference. When we read verse 13, look here at verse 13. And now abideth faith, hope, charity. These three, but the greatest of these is what? Charity. There is something about the love and charity that God, our Heavenly Father, is seeking to produce in the realm of our inner man that He seeks to produce in the realm of our thinking, which is set apart from any act of benevolence that the world can engage in. Now, it is important to understand what charity is when we talk about charity. In the Bible, charity is that spirit led compulsion to liberally, to graciously, to benevolently do good towards others. The difference between the type of charity we're seeking to exhibit and the type of charity the world engages in, I think is best illustrated in Romans chapter 12. Go to Romans chapter 12. And uh, we have here, I think, an interesting illustration of the difference between the world's acts of charity and the type of life we are taught to demonstrate. And you know what? Maybe before we even read this passage, I hope you understand when Paul says the greatest of these is what? Charity. Go over to first, tell you what, let's go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. Go to 1 Timothy chapter 1. The greatest, you know, when we 
talk about spiritual growth and edification and spiritual maturity, right? Paul says there are three elements that currently abide. Faith, hope, and what? Charity. The greatest is charity. Sometimes we measure spiritual maturity based upon the amount of information that we accumulate, based upon the deep understanding of God's Word. Please don't get me wrong. We want to study and learn the deep doctrines of Scripture. But that isn't the end all. The study of Scripture, the, the great revelation that God deposited and entrusted to the Apostle Paul, that entire system of revealed truth that God calls grace. It needs to be studied. We need to value it. But the goal isn't simply to possess all of that scriptural truth, all of the details of that doctrine. The goal, notice what Paul says in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 5. Now, the end of the commandment is what? Charity. Interesting. The highest level of spiritual maturity and understanding isn't how much you know, but it's charity. It's how much you give. It's how much charity is the way God treats People. Love, by the way, is truly a mental attitude love. Love is the way we view people. And I hope we view people the way God views people. Charity, on the other hand, is the way we treat people. It's the way God would treat people. But when verse 5, Paul says the end of the commandment. Now, what commandment is Paul talking about? Look up there at verse 1. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the what? commandment of God, our Savior, the apostleship of Paul, God's official spokesman for the dispensation of the grace of God, God who entrusted to the apostle this entire system of revealed truth. You know what the end, as in the goal. When Paul in verse 5 says the end of the command, what is the goal of Paul's apostleship? What is God's objective in raising up this apostle to communicate this international message of grace? The end all, the objective is what? Charity. That is the high mark of spiritual maturity. That's why Paul says the greatest of these is what? Charity. Go over to Colossians chapter 3. And, and, I, and I hope you understand. I certainly believe and we must study to show ourselves approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed. What? Rightly dividing the truth. I am not suggesting that the study of Scripture, it takes a back seat to anything. But understand what is it that God is seeking to achieve in you? And in his people. A mentality. A heart of selfless. Sacrificial. Spirit empowered. Benevolence. To others. Colossians chapter 3. Look here. <clears throat> Excuse me. At verse 12. Verse 12. Of Colossians 3, put on therefore as the elect of God, holy and beloved, bowels of mercies, kindness, humbleness of mind, meekness, long suffering, forbearing one another and forgiving one another. If any man have a quarrel against any, even as Christ forgave you, so also do ye. And above all these things, put on what? Charity, which is the bond of what? The crowning icing on the cake, the crowning jewel is charity. The bond of what? Perfectness. So, was what Prince has been doing for most of his life, donating hundreds of thousands of dollars, is it an act of charity? Well, the world will say that, yeah, that is an act of charity. Well, what does the Bible say? about charity. Go to Romans chapter 12. And here is, I think, a good illustration. The difference between the world's usage of labor of love and the Bible's usage of labor of love. 
Here in Romans chapter 12, notice there in verse 17. Romans 12, verse 17. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Now, Paul certainly isn't saying, hey, listen, you need to do everything you can and, 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 and you try to be at peace with others. And if you can't be at peace with others, it's okay, just be content. That isn't the challenge here. The challenge here is we have no right to seek vengeance. We have no right to seek retribution. We have a duty and an obligation to be at peace with everyone. But if they're not at peace with you, do we suspend being at peace with them? No. You let the other guy be at fault. If there isn't peace between you and the enemy, and that's what Paul's talking about here. Listen, if there's lack of peace, it isn't because of us. It's because of them. Now, let's look there at verse uh, 17 again. Recompense to no man evil for evil. Provide things honest in the sight of all men. If it be possible, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine. I will repay, saith the Lord. Now look at verse 20. Therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. Wait, wait, what did Paul say in 1 Corinthians 13, verse 3? Though I bestow all my goods to the who? To the poor. And, I, and yet, if I don't have charity. You see, what Paul is describing in Romans 12 is this. Charity, the act of spirit-led, spirit-empowered, spirit-controlled, liberal benevolence is shown to the enemy. See, it's a type of charity that values those who are opposed, those who will reject, those who are at odds, those who harbor ire and animosity against you. You see, verse 19 or verse uh, 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, what are you supposed to do? Feed him. If he thirst, what are you supposed to do? That's charity. That's God's attitude and God's treatment of those who are unlovely, unworthy, dishonorable, those who may be actively engaged against you, against your labor, against the message, against your ministry. You know what charity does? I will selflessly, sacrificially minister to the one who is opposed to what I'm doing. See, that's a little different than operating an animal shelter or volunteering in a hospital. Again, those are wonderful, benevolent acts. But when God talks about labor of love, it is driven by this godly understanding of what charity truly is. And again, it's the greatest. It is the hallmark characteristic. It is the highest of spiritual marks of growth and maturity. Oh, don't let the doctrine just fill the head like the Dead Sea. Full of the data, full of the information. I'll never forget one year, and I'm not trying to criticize anybody, and uh, we're talking about God's Word, and all she could say is, well, we don't water baptize. Oh, I, praise God. Uh, why don't we water baptize? Paul's my apostle. Wonderful. Why is Paul the apostle? Please, those are important issues that we must understand. But it's a means to an end. What is the end of the commandment? Charity. It's supposed to affect change in the way we think and in turn in the way we relate. Let's talk about... So, so when we think about charity or love, the Lord here provides illustrations of the manifestation of divine charity. You don't look at that enemy as an enemy. We don't treat the enemy as the enemy. We're supposed to be at peace with them. 
We're supposed to look at verse 9 of chapter 12. Let love be without what? Dissimulation. We'll talk about that in just a second. Now notice, abhor that which is what? Now, I know in a general sense, Paul isn't saying abhor that which is evil in a general sense. In the context, what is the evil that Paul is now going to describe? Abhor that which is evil. Uh, Again, should we abhor the uh, policy of uh, evil and and abhor the the acts of darkness and the operation of darkness? Absolutely. I hope you abhor sin. I hope you abhor wickedness. But in the immediate context, when Paul says, hate this kind of evil, well, what evil did we just read about? Verse 17, recompense to no man, what? Evil for what? Abhor that. If someone perpetuates evil against you, are we supposed to recompense that evil with evil? No. I hope you abhor that thought. The evil that Paul is now going to describe is this desire to recompense evil, to get even, to get back. Look at verse 19 again. Dearly beloved, avenge not yourself. You know, it's evil to retaliate. But of course, our flesh seeks to what? Retaliate. You do me wrong, I'll do you wrong. That's not charity. Paul says that's evil. For anyone to seek To avenge. For anyone, a believer, to seek to retaliate. For anyone, verse uh, verse 19, dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto what? Wrath, that's evil. You see, if somebody strikes out, somebody seeks to harm. We're not to be driven by that selfless, selfish desire of self-preservation. Protect my feelings, protect my identity, protect my reputation. Abhor that kind of stuff. But rather, verse 9 says, abhor that which is evil and cleave to that which is what? Look at verse 21 again. Well, by the way, what is the good in the context? Verse 20, therefore, if thine enemy hunger, feed him. If he thirst, give him drink. For in so doing, thou shalt heap coals of fire. And it said, be not overcome of evil, but overcome evil with what? The response to evil is what? If evil is the propensity to retaliate, you know what the goodness is? The goodness is, listen, I will aid and help and assist and feed and and, and provide. Because true charity seeks to do good for the benefit and for the health of the other person. Even if they're your enemy. Critically important, I think, to understand what the Bible has to say about charity. Our labor, now going back to 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. So, of course, the Apostle Paul here, he commends the Thessalonians for their labor of love. Again, it's, it's, it's a type of labor. It's the quality of labor which results from this high understanding of what drives God. This high understanding of what it means to be spiritually mature. The apex of sound Bible doctrine and the understanding of sound Bible doctrine. The apex is the manifestation, the outward demonstration of the inward working of God's word. The goal isn't, look at what I know. The goal is, look at what I can do. And that's what the Lord is driving. And and that is how Paul is challenging Timothy. 1 Thessalonians chapter 1, we already, already read verse 3. Remembering without ceasing your work of faith and labor of love. Now, the word labor, if I can comment on that for just a second. Don't turn there. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 10. There's a difference between work and labor. The writer of Hebrews, he, he commends the Hebrews for their work and uh, labor. Obviously, there's a difference, right? If it means one and the same thing, it would be pretty redundant, right? For Paul, uh, for the, the writer to Hebrews to say, hey, you know what? I commend you for your work and work. No, I commend you for your work and labor. Labor is different than work. And Paul in chapter 2 is going to provide us a little glimpse of labor. Now, of course, we can go to the dictionary definition. It's a Latin word which means to toil. 
It means to be distressed. Oxford English Dictionary. This is a fascinating definition. According to the Oxford uh, English Dictionary, to labor means to take pains. It's the strenuous, painful exertion which requires enormous strength. Hold that thought. It is this exertion of, of, of toil and strain. And yeah, sometimes it's going to be painful. But what is it that compels anyone to toil and to strain in the labor of ministry? There needs to be this enormous capacity, this limitless power that will drive you to do it. And Paul's going to give us a, an illustration. Chapter 2, verse 7. Chapter 2, verse 7. But we were gentle among you, even as a nurse cherisheth her what? Now, the, 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 the picture here is, it, it's a, a mother who just gave birth. A mother who is nursing an infant, right? Fascinating how Paul likens his ministry, his view, his way of ministry among the Thessalonians. He likens it to a nursing mom. Verse 7, but we were gentle among you, even as the nurse cherisheth their children. So being affectionately desirous of you, we were willing to have imparted unto you, not the gospel of God only, but our own souls, because ye were dear unto us. For ye remember, brethren, our labor and uh, travail for laboring night and day because we would not be chargeable unto any of you. We preach unto you the gospel of God. Isn't it interesting? Oftentimes when the Bible describes labor, how is that labor used? What, what is oftentimes in, the, in God's word, oftentimes what is used to illustrate labor? A woman. Who gives birth? I gave birth yesterday to a bouncing kidney stone. And, uh, and, 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 and you know, the Bible uses that example to labor. But listen, a mother. Now listen, I didn't like what I delivered yesterday, okay? But a mother who delivers a baby. You know, the nurse that was tending me, she said, yeah, when I was in nursing school, my instructor, an elderly lady at the time, uh, she had seven children. And in her lifetime, but she's also passed kidney stones in her lifetime. This nurse said, I would rather have seven more children than to pass another kidney stone. I mean, it's, it's not fun. It is painful, okay? But, but when the Bible uses, we use the word labor to describe a woman who is what? Delivering. Paul uses the same kind of language. When we, verse 9, for ye remember, brethren, our labor... And travail. Paul talks a lot about his labor. Go over, for example, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter, what is the labor that Paul engaged in? 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And now again, you know, Paul isn't just bragging and Paul does focus in on his ministry, his work, his labor. And Paul, by the way, he exemplifies labor. He exemplifies what ministry is. He exemplifies to what degree, at what measure are we to engage in the labor of ministry. And yet Paul, whenever he talks about his labor, he does refer to a spiritual capacity that enabled him to do it. Remember, it's called the labor of what? Love. You see, the enormous strength that God provides, it has something to do with love. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. This is the grace of God that called Paul to be apostle. Look at the end of verse 10. But I labored more abundantly than they all. Think about that for a second. Now, Paul is not demeaning. He's not, you know, he's not attacking the, the apostles. In the context, he's talking about these other apostles, right? 
when Paul says, listen, I labor more abundantly than Peter and all these other apostles. You know, he is not dissing Peter. He's not suggesting that, you know, all of those other apostles uh, look there at verse nine. For I am the least of the apostles and am not, and am not worthy uh, am not meet to be called an apostle. Right. So so he lists there are all of these other apostles. We know who these other apostles are. Right. Paul, it, by, in no way is he saying, you know, those guys were so lazy. They were so derelict. And that's why he says in verse 10, but I labored more abundantly than they all. You you see, don't read it as though all Paul is criticizing those other apostles that they didn't have the mustard to do the job. Listen, you know why Paul labored more than all those other apostles? Because God gave to Paul a global outreach ministry. So you think about that for a second. Those other apostles, their ministry was confined to who? The circumcision. So Paul is not saying Peter was a a lackey, uh, he was derelict, and you know what? He was so inferior so that so now God reaches down and says, Paul, since Peter can't do it, I'm going to let you know two different ministries. Paul was entrusted with a gospel message, which is to be communicated to how many nations? All nations. That wasn't the other apostles job. You see that? So you understand, why is Paul saying, I labored more abundantly? Listen, Paul's field of ministry is global. That was not true of Peter. So don't think Paul is disrespecting Peter. The Bible isn't trying to diss Peter, okay? But notice, when Paul says, I labored more abundantly than they all. Now, notice what he says. Yet, not I, but... The grace of God, which was with me. Wait a minute. The the labor that Paul strenuously engaged in. He never for a moment would ever suggest, you see what I'm able to do here? Look at the power of my resources and my own ability. God, Paul will always remark that it wasn't me, but it was something working in me. That provided this spiritual strength, this limitless capacity as the dictionary definition, this enormous strength to be able to toil and to struggle in the work of the ministry. Now, here in verse 10, he says, not I, but the grace of God, which was which was with me. We'll come back to that. Go to chapter or second Corinthians chapter 11. Second Corinthians chapter 11. I, I just want you to understand. Paul does talk about his labor frequently in um, in second Corinthians chapter 11. Remember, he reminds the Thessalonians, hey, you remember my labor and travail. Why is he? Why does he say to the Thessalonians, you remember my labor and travail? Is he looking for a gold star? Is Paul looking for a pat on his back? Is Paul saying, listen, you know what? I deserve more respect and I deserve more recognition. And and you remember everything I did for you, right? And now you owe me. And now there's another. You know why Paul says, you remember my labor? Listen, it was otherworldly. What Paul is pressing upon the thinking there at Thessalonica is, listen, it isn't you, but it's a power. That God provides, okay? That's why Paul says, you remember how I'm laboring? Listen, it's because of what Christ is doing in me. In 2 Corinthians chapter 11, look there at verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool. I am more in labors. More what? But what? Paul, man, he keeps bragging. Look at all. Look, more abundant. Go over to Galatians chapter 2. Galatians chapter 2. Now, he's not bragging because of what he's capable of doing. You know why he's bragging? Because of the grace of God which is in me. In Galatians chapter 2, verse 8. Galatians 2, verse 8. For he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. By the way, was God working in Peter? Was God working effectually? How dare anybody suggest that Peter was a failure? And that Peter was was unfaithful, that Peter was derelict. Therefore, God had to select Paul to be Peter's replacement. 
I've heard that taught by evangelical traditional. See, you know, why Paul? Remember the question, you know, Richard's got that book. Why Paul? Well, because Peter failed. Don't ever accuse Peter of How in the world can you accuse Peter of failing when in Acts chapter 1 and 2, was he not led by the Holy Spirit? If you're going to accuse Peter of being a failure in ministry, hence, I got to get another guy in there. Hey, Saul, you're kind of one of the, I'm going to scrape the bottom of the barrel here. Saul, you know what? I'm going to, I'm going to raise you up because Peter is an absolute flop. Well, then you're going to have to call the Holy Spirit a failure. Because Peter did everything and anything in light of ministry according to, according to verse nine, uh, verse eight, for he that wrought effectually. You see, is God working in Peter? Hey, listen, he that wrought effectually in Peter to the apostleship of the circumcision. Now notice, the same was mighty in me. Paul, I'm laboring more abundantly. I'm laboring more than all those other guys. Because of what I've been given. And, and, and that work of labor and ministry, it's mighty in me. Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. And notice there in verse 29. Colossians 1 verse 29. Colossians 1 29. Whereunto I also labor, striving. You see how he uses that word strive? Now, he already used the word travail. It's not just a lackadaisical, you know, I'm going to punch the clock at 8 o'clock and and punch out at at 5 o'clock. It's not just I'm working. It's this strenuous toil. He's saying there in verse 29, I labor striving. But now notice, according to his working, which worketh in me how? When Paul brags about his labor, who gets all the glory? Who gets all the credit? The spotlight of of labor is focused on who? The one working in him. That's why Paul keeps talking about, look at what I'm capable of doing. Pastor Stam, he wrote an article. The amazing energy of Paul. The amazing energy. What drove Paul? What compelled the Apostle Paul? What gave to the Apostle Paul this divine, limitless capacity? And, and you know, you just, why don't we real quickly appreciate Paul's labor here. Go to, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. I, I know I've, I always have to go to this passage to remind myself. Listen, when Paul talks about labor and, and the extent of ministry... You know, I, it puts me to shame. Second Corinthians chapter 11, verse 23. Are they ministers of Christ? Second Corinthians eleven twenty three. I speak as a fool. I am what? More. See, Paul, Paul's bragging, not about himself, but the one who's working in him. I am more in labors more abundantly, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequent, in deaths often. Of the, of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes. I, twice was I beaten uh, with rod. Once was I stoned. Twice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day I've been in the deep. In journeyings often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among the false brethren. Hey, is he trying to win sympathy here? Is he trying to say, hey, you correct? He's not trying to win sympathy here. What he's going to demonstrate is, do you understand not only the level of ministry that Paul was engaged in, but the spiritual capacity that drove him to such lengths, to such dire cost? Who in the world would be ever willing to endure this type of rejection and suffering and affliction? What is the element that drove Paul? It's love. Keep reading. Verse 20, 27. In weariness and painfulness and watchings often in hunger and thirst and fasting of it in cold and nakedness besides those things that are without that which cometh upon me the care of all the churches who is weak and I am not weak who is offended and I burn not. If I must needs glory I will glory of the things which concern my infirmities. What is it that drove Paul? 
Go, to, go back to 1 Corinthians 15, go to Galatians chapter 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, Galatians chapter 2. When Paul talks about labor of love, it's the quality of labor. The, and, and we just read a list. Did you catch the quality of labor? The abuse Paul took? Remember what charity is, right? Charity is the greatest. And charity is exemplified when, listen, it's an attitude and it's, it's the, the good and it's the treatment, not of those that love you, not towards those that appreciate you, not towards those that, that pat you on the head. Charity has the same level of love and desire to treat the enemy, those that are antagonistic. It's the desire to do good to them. And this is an otherworldly. I don't want to sound spooky, but it is of divine origin. And it is of divine origin. First Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10 again. At, at the end of the verse, the, the second half of the verse. But I labor more abundantly than they all. Now notice, yet not I, but the grace of God, which was with me. Notice how he says in Galatians chapter 2. Turn to Galatians chapter 2. And notice how he says it here in Galatians chapter 2, verse 20. Galatians 2, verse 20. I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Now, yet not I. Isn't that what we just read in 1 Corinthians 15? verse? Yet not I. I am laboring, toiling strenuously. But the capacity to perform. It's not me doing it. It's not I doing it. Now, to the Corinthians, he says, but it's the grace of God in me. Look how he says it here. I am, verse 20, crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God, who what loved me. And gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of what? You know, Paul defines the grace of God that is operating and indwelling and possessing and captivating and compelling Paul. The grace of God that Paul's referring to is the one, the person in whom, to whom he loved me and gave himself for me. The labor of love. What sets it apart from the world? The highest level of spiritual maturity is when love drives the believer to strenuously labor. Go back to Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Paul says, I know whom I believed. Paul knew something. He had this deeper, fuller understanding of what the Lord Jesus Christ did for him. In love. It was love that captured Paul's heart. It was love that sustained Paul. It was love that fueled his labor of love. Not to a world that embraced him, but to a world that spitefully hated him. But yet Paul kept doing it, didn't he? Romans chapter 12, verse 9. Let love be Without dissimulation. That's an important word, dissimulation. You know what God wants? The type of love that we are to be driven by, it's supposed to be an exact copy. You know, if it's simulated, not really real, is it? without dissimulation. The Lord desires each of us to exemplify a love which is a replica, a match, a counterbalance. The type of love that we are exhorted to possess is the type of love that genuinely and accurately reflects resembling the love that God possesses. So when Paul says, let it be without dissimulation, go to Ephesians chapter 5, Ephesians chapter 5. We have a glimpse here of this type of love. Ephesians chapter 5, verse 1. 
Ephesians 5, verse 1, Be ye therefore followers of God as dear children, and, now notice this, walk in love. You know what? The verse doesn't say love. It doesn't, verse 2 doesn't say go in love. What does verse 2 say? Walk where? In love. That's the sphere in which we live. If you're walking in love, love is the very thing that affects, influences us. To walk in love means we live with this prevailing sense and prevailing understanding of what? His love. That's who we are. Walking in love is a way of life. It's a lifestyle. Paul is not saying, I want you to go out there and start loving people. Although, if you're walking in love, and if we're going to resemble, if it's without dissimulation, will we not reflect the same full measure of God's love for everybody else? That's what Paul's getting at. Verse 2, walk in love. Again, that's where we dwell. As Christ also loved us. You see how we're supposed to think? My love for you, my love for the enemy is to be an exact, genuine replica of the type of love that God has for that enemy. Did God die for my enemy? Absolutely. As Christ also loved us and hath given himself for us an offering. And, you know, it's easy to read the verse and think, oh, I see. I'm supposed to love the world just like Christ loves us. Wait a minute. I walk in love as Christ loved me. What is it that he's done for me? He gave himself for me. When Paul says, listen, I labored more abundantly than all of those other guys, but it wasn't me, not I, but the grace of God in me. When he says, listen, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life that I now live, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Over and over, Paul is focusing in on the deep, rich, intense love that the Savior has for him. Go there to chapter 3. <clears throat> Look at chapter 3, verse 17. Chapter 3, verse 17, that Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye, being rooted and grounded in love, may be able to comprehend with all saints what is the breadth and length and depth and height, and to know. You see the word know? Not in an intellectual, oh, I understand, you know, one plus one equals two. No, this is a working knowledge, a fuller, richer understanding of the length and the and the uh, uh, the the expanse of His love to know the love of Christ, which path this knowledge that ye might be filled with all the what the fullness. Of, what is it that God wants to fill each and every one of us with? Love. This comprehensive understanding of how much does God love you. The labor of love, the high quality, the high mark of that type of work and ministry endeavor is because of this residing love that penetrates the very core of our being. It's a type of love that truly does prevail in its presence and its, its awareness. Romans chapter 5. Now, we're going we're gonna to move very quickly as we're winding it down. Go to Romans chapter 5 and then go to... Uh, 2 Timothy chapter 2 again, all right? <clears throat> 2 Timothy chapter 1, I'm sorry. Go to Romans chapter 5, and then 2 Timothy. Romans chapter 5. Now, let's read 2 Timothy chapter 1 again, and let's read verse 12 again, real quick. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. Okay? Now, 2 Timothy, it's the end of his life, right? It's the end of his ministry. Paul says, I finished my course. So what does he say at the end of his life, at the end of his ministry? Verse 12, for the which cause I also suffer these things. Nevertheless, I am not what? Why? For I know whom 
Now, let's read Romans chapter 5. Look at Romans chapter 5, verse 5. Romans 5, 5. Romans 5, 5. And hope maketh not ashamed. Why? Because the love of God is shed abroad where? You see what Paul's saying here? Now, in the context, you know what Paul's talking about. Here's a nut. Here's a madman who actually has... Look what he says there in verse uh, 2. Uh, of verse 2. By whom also we have access by faith into this grace wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Look at verse 3. And not only so, but we glory in uh, tribulation. You see what Paul's attitude is? Life is not an enemy. Chill out. There will be problems. Uh, we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulation worketh patience, patience experience, experience hope, verse 5, and hope maketh not ashamed. Why is that, Paul? Because the love of God is shed. Where? Abroad in our heart. You know why Paul was able to labor more abundantly and he was willing to be in jeopardy every hour? Why Paul says, I die daily to, to labor more abundantly than they all? The, 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 the thing that just captured Paul's heart was the love of God shed where? Abroad in our hearts. The Apostle Paul, he viewed the tribulation, the labor, he viewed the work. In fact, he viewed life based upon the very value that God had for him. When he says the love of God, that truly is a reference to how much did God regard Paul? How much did God value Paul? How much did God uh, honor and esteem Paul? How dear, Paul says, be ye followers of God as what? Dear children. We are the beloved of God. We understand we are the first love. We are greatly loved. But his great love where which he loved us. You know what Paul did? He allowed that understanding the depth and the wealth and the extent of his love. It occupied his heart. It was shed abroad. And, and to understand when Paul says it's shed abroad... What he's saying is this, the same measure of love and devotion that occupies the heart of God is to now reside in our hearts. You know, you just think about that. The same love that God has for you in all of its deep richness, it's supposed to what? Reside in me. My heart is to be an accurate reflection of his heart. And his heart says to me, I do love you. I love you tremendously. I love you deeply. You're dear to me. You're beloved to me. Paul keeps saying, listen, there's something in me that's motivating and driving. He says, it's the love of God which is shed abroad. You know what it means when you travel to overseas, right? Right out of heaven, right into our heart, by the Holy Ghost, which is given unto us. God, the Holy Ghost, is committed in providing the, the information, the, the, the doctrine, that enables us to fully grasp the depth of love that does exist, the Father's love for us. Now, go to Romans chapter 8. In light of all of that, in light of all of that, oh, let me, let's, let's ask the question that Paul asks. Romans chapter 8. Look at Romans chapter 8, verse 31. What shall we then say to these things? I love that. So what are you going to do about it? Think about it. God loves you so much. God loves you so deeply. God loves you with, with, with such tremendous affection and devotion and adoration. He loves you with such intensity. What are you going to do about it? Now, remember, charity is what? The greatest. Listen, studying the information, critically important, but the end of the commandment is what? Do something about it. Do something with it. 
live outside of this selfish desire to just have a warm, happy, carefree life. What are we going to do now with it? And I love the question, what shall we then say to these things? What conclusion are we going to draw? Does God love you that deeply? If that's true, then what's the problem ultimately in God's sight? What happens when labor begins to hurt? Paul gave us that whole list, right? And he hurt. He hurt big time. But look there at verse 35. Who shall separate us from the what? Now, Paul's Paul's not talking. This is not intended to address the issue of eternal security. Uh, By the way, are we eternally secure? Absolutely. And this is a passage you can use to demonstrate eternal security. But the primary intent here isn't to reaffirm that nothing positionally is ever going to set. Paul is talking about the circumstances and events of life and work and ministry and the labor. So remember that in the immediate context, Paul's not saying, hey, don't forget that you can never lose your salvation. That, that, no, Paul is now saying, if all of that love that is to be shed abroad in our hearts, if that is true, what are we going to do about it? What in life can ever cause us to be separated in our thinking? What in life can ever cause us to be distant from what God is doing? Paul begins to list a number of different situations and circumstances that will occur in life and in ministry that if kept unchecked will produce this gaping gap between our understanding of His love for And to us. That's what the Apostle Paul here is talking about. When he says in verse 35. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Wait a minute. Aren't we supposed to be continually aware of his deep love? He gave himself for me. He loved me. I'm supposed to walk where? In love. That's my address. That's where I live. In love. But now when life attacks, when labor begins to hurt. Wait a minute. Verse 35, who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall. Now, wait a minute. Didn't Paul already say something about tribulation in chapter 5? Wait a minute. The attitude that God says we're supposed to have when tribulation strikes is what? Wait a minute. We rejoice in it. We rejoice in tribulation. Why? Because tribulation worketh. Work of patience, experience, experience, hope, and hope makes not ashamed. Why? The love of God is shit. His deep value and view. And and for me, it saturated my heart. And the heart, of course, is the realm of our thinking, right? The mentality of our soul. The heart can obey. The heart responds to doctrine. But, But you know what's supposed to saturate our heart? It's shed where? Abroad, every nook and cranny of our mental under love. So, okay, verse 35, shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? Listen, I don't want these things to happen. I don't want these things to happen to you. Can it happen? Did it happen? Paul went through it all. What sustained him? Listen, it's not me doing it. Not I. But Christ, the one who loved me. So he keeps going. Verse 36, as is written, for thy sake, we are killed all day long. We are as counted as sheep for the slaughter. Look at verse 37. Nay, in all these things, we are more than conquerors through him that what? Loved us. We're conquerors. Conquerors in what sense? Listen, we can continue in the work of the labor, regardless of the, of the adversity, regardless of the opposition, regardless of what might be happening, because we're kept by this intense understanding of how much he loves and values us. We're more than conquerors through him that loved us. Look at verse 38. For I am what? I'm persuaded. Now, remember, he asked the question in verse 31. What are we going to say about these things? What conclusion are we going to draw? You know what Paul says? I'm persuaded. Paul, his thinking, it's, it's set like concrete. It's settled. 
Well, you know what my persuasion is? I'm a victor. I'm a, I'm a conqueror. And yes, all of those circumstances that true, it was true in Paul's life. But he kept doing it, right? Verse, verse 38, for I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God. Don't think positionally, think practically. Don't think eternally. Think here and now and the commitment that Paul made to toil strenuously in the labor of ministry. What drove him? The love of God. Nothing's going to separate him from that. Father, we do thank you for your grace. We do thank you for your love. We do thank you, Father, for that love which you uh, certainly have taught us through, through, through your word. May it be a love that, that truly does uh, change, not only the way we think, but affect the way that we live life. May charity be the greatest. May it be the, the bond of perfection. May we understand that it is the goal. It is the end of all that you seek and desire from us. And may your love uh, be the sole motivation for everything we ever do in, in life. And we, of course, ask these things in Christ's name.